welcome to technically day three of our Clarinet Days event, a week-long event where we are um, basically featuring our Clarinet manufacturers, a few of them. And today we are very excited to be featuring Buffet. And of course we have Matt Vance, um, the Woodwind Product Specialist for Buffet USA, or North America, I should say. <laughs> and we also have Minnesota Orchestra's principal clarinetist, uh, Gabrielle Camposomora. Thank you so much for being here. We're looking forward to just having some fun um, and seeing what kind of questions we can get. So whoever is out there, welcome attendees. Um, please feel free to put in the chat section um, the questions that you have for anybody, really. So, <laughs> um, Amelia, would you like to start off with our first question? Yeah, sure. Um, so let's begin with um, how many people are usually involved in creating a new model, like the concept and the design and engineering and all of that? Wow, that's a that's a great question and a, and a very um, detailed question and answer. Um, the most recent example that I was involved in directly was the tradition clarinet. Um, this was a model that we really started um, developing, I believe it was in 2015. And we were approached by our colleagues in France at the Buffet Crampon in uh, Montlegueil, outside of Paris. Uh, they were interested in developing a new model and they wanted to develop a model with the US market in mind. And it was something that we were obviously very excited about. Uh, because we had never been directly involved in the design of a new clarinet model. And so they, they came to us with, with kind of a starting point. And the starting point was an older model that had been manufactured by Buffet Grimpon in the early 60s. It was a model called the BC-20. And it was a model that um, uh, Players really like the sound of the instrument, but it had some tuning issues. So it was in production for a few years and then it, it kind of fell out of favor and they took it out of production. Uh, it had a cylindrical bore and that was one of the things that they really liked about it was the fact that it got a really sweet, beautiful sound. It was the Buffet Crampon ring to the sound, but it was a little different flavor than what we got with the R13 bore. And so uh, they went back to that bore design and they approached uh, Francois Clock, our president and CEO, and then I got involved. And we, um, we decided to put together an artist team of American artists to uh, give us input on the design of this clarinet. And it was some clarinet luminaries. Uh, one of them was actually uh, Gabby's predecessor with the Minnesota Orchestra with Bert Hara, who's now with the Los Angeles Philharmonic. He was on the design team. Uh, Greg Radin, Mark Duccio, Jonathan Gunn, and uh, Victoria Luteri, uh, all top flight orchestral players in the United States. And we brought them into Jacksonville, which is where our North American headquarters are located. Uh, we brought them in twice. And my colleagues from France, uh, Gregory Demayer came over. Uh, Eric Beret also came over, who is one of the lead designers and acousticians at Buffet. And they laid out a bunch of clarinets on a table and we put them all in a room and we said play all these clarinets and tell us what you think and tell us which ones you like and after uh, several passes on the different variations of clarinet models uh, they all settled on a design that was the original tradition that was introduced in 2016 and then of course we have what I refer to as version two or variation two which we introduced in 2019, and that's the current version of the tradition clarinet that we have today. Some design tweaks with the, the post plating and the addition of the low F resonance key to make it a little more of, a, of an upscale model. But uh, the board design and the tone hole placement uh, that came from the Tosca clarinet, actually, those have all remained the same. So it was a really exciting process for me to be involved with, and, and I hope I get that opportunity again. Nice. That's pretty cool. So um, sometimes we get a question about, um, you know, becoming an artist for a buffet. So Gabby, you might be able to chime in on this one. How do you become an artist for a buffet? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I wish I had a good answer for that. Um, well, there's, there's obviously different types of artists. Um, 
some of us are performers we're, we're playing the orchestra um some of us travel we play chamber music solo uh and some other people of course teach um i'm not so sure that i'm the right person to answer that question specifically you know who gets to be on the roster um and you know if it's a young person who's who's asking you know how do you get on the buffet roster my my answer would be well try to um use all of your energy including the one you're spending thinking about how to get on the roster and practice and and make sure that you're working hard and that you're focusing on your craft um and you know eventually um you'll get heard literally heard and you'll audition and and you'll you know gain a, a certain reputation and and you know if 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 buffet is the right clarinet for you like it is for me um then you know hopefully um uh, they'll consider having uh, some other great players on the roster nice i think that's great advice um it we're we're approached pretty regularly by players who are interested in being on the roster. And there, there are different ways that, that artists are added to the roster. Um, sometimes we get approached by, by uh, clarinetists that are fresh out of college. And uh, they ask, well, you know, can I become a, a perfect from fun clarinet artist? And we do have a process. We have an artist relations manager. Her name is Magali Tritosh. And she handles all the interactions with our artist roster and any prospective artists. There is an application process, but it really does boil down to, as, as Gabby said, experience and honing your craft and, and not to, to use a colloquialism, not to put the cart in front of the horse. Um, if you really work hard and you, and you become a fine clarinetist and a fine musician, and just as importantly, a fine person, then things like becoming an artist for Buffet Grandpon will come to you. Um, it's not so much that, well, I need, I, I look good on paper and I have a website and I have a, a small studio of students and I've done this solo performance and that. Those, those are all very important things in building your reputation and building your resume, but it really is a matter of, of you personally growing and achieving things to where you are ready to become an artist. And it, it's it's a process. I mean, you know, we were thrilled to add Gabby to our artist when he when he joined the Minnesota Orchestra. He's at a very high profile, very prestigious position with the Minnesota Orchestra as principal clarinet. And uh, and we were we were thrilled to to make him a member of our roster. And and he's he's a good example of hard work and musicianship uh, getting you to that point to uh, be able to be on our roster. A lot of compliments. Thanks. <laughs> it's all true. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yep. Um, okay. My next one is kind of in that same vein a little bit, um, just kind of getting into a certain field. So for instrument repair, um, I guess specifically, you know, woodwind repair or anything, um, how would you advise that they get started if someone is interested in that? Oh, gosh. I mean, they're... There are a lot of different avenues to, to growing and, and getting experience in, in repair and adjustment. I myself am not a technician or a repair person, so I can't speak firsthand on that experience. Gabby, do you do any, any work on your clarinets or, or do you have any experience with that? I do. I also had a thought for you know those people who, who might be interested in repair. Um, from an early age, um, um, I had an interest mainly because I was playing on the conservatory's instruments. This is back home in Costa Rica, and they weren't in the, in the best of shapes. So, um, and I didn't always have the money to um, to fix my horns. Uh, certainly not with a you know top notch uh, repair person. Um, but uh, I, I think if if you do have an interest, I, I would say go ahead and and. You know, I, I imagine that in, in the YouTube area, there's plenty of resources that, that will guide you through or, or just call someone also to ask for advice and, and get interested because it is a good skill to have. And, and beyond that, you know, if you're not going to become a, a professional repair person, I, I'm not one. Um, I think that because I, I know the, the technicalities of the instrument, I'm, I'm better able to express uh, to my repair person what I like. Uh, to be done, 
Um, and the other thing I wanted to say was that, um, especially if you're a player, um, I think that's a huge plus, at least from my point of view, as far as being a repair person, because there's a certain language, right, that, that we uh, use uh, between players and, and perhaps some of the things that you've been bothered with or, or that you've wanted to improve are the same as, as me. Uh, and, and so, you know, definitely being a clarinetist is, is, is a plus as far as becoming a repair person. Yeah, and I think that's, that's to the, the technician's advantage too, is the fact that you can speak the language um, and you're able to directly relate to an issue that uh, a client is having with their clarinet, you know, say, well, you know, I'm having this issue and to be able to understand firsthand what that issue is and, and you're going to have a more intimate relationship with the instrument and really be able to identify what the problem is as far as just looking at it as you know, kind of like a widget. So yeah, I think that's great advice. Yes, absolutely. That's one thing that I learned as a player, kind of speaking what you're talking about, Gabby, is um, me learning a little bit more about repair, not just being a player. I could speak then the technical language. So I could then, like you said, you know, be able to translate that a little bit because it is it is a, a challenge sometimes if you're if you don't have a player, you know, working on your instrument. It's like, uh, this is what I'm feeling. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> sure. So sure. But yeah, and, that's and and to circle back to the uh, the theme of practice, you know, I, I think that the more you practice, the more you become acquainted with your instrument, and and you're going to be able to express more specifically what you need exactly. I mean, through it's taken me years to realize that, for example, my key tension is light. I like everything to just bounce off. I don't like a whole lot of um, weight especially on the pinky keys because i don't want to have to work for it so so much which is interesting because then i'll play somebody else's horn and, and they'll be a little bit tighter and, and i just find like <laughs> like my fingers are not strong enough right but uh that that sort of thing and of course our physiologies are very different so uh under things like undercutting or filling in tone holes is going to be different for each person just because the way we blow is so different um, I don't know if I'm going a bit off topic here. Uh, all I'm saying is, you know, the better acquainted you are with your instrument, and this is important to consider in a trial process, right? You can't, you should be picky and you should be strict with, with what you're going to uh, choose ultimately. But at the same time, you have to allow, you have to plan that, that it's going to be, you know, about a year for you to really get familiar with the instrument. I mean, I, I bought my last set of horns, Help me out, Tori. Three years ago? Yeah, it might even be one more. I got one from, from you, actually. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I would say it took me a, at least a year, maybe two, to really get very comfortable with uh, that particular horn, especially because I was playing on a different type of, of, uh, of, of bufe clarinet before that. Yeah. Yeah, and that kind of leads me to um, another question um, as well as, you know, well, first of all, Gabby, what are you playing on? I play on festivals, both the B flat and A. And yeah. have you have you always played on festivals or what kind of came before for you? So the the horns that I mentioned, from the, my very first horn was a plastic laser. <laughs> I don't even know if you're aware that Laser, which is a music company, I don't even know if they exist anymore. They, they typically make drum sets and things like that, but they make clarinet. That was my first clarinet. I have no idea where the thing is. I think I gave it to someone who was getting started. Anyway, so after that, I played on the conservatory's instruments. They were the competition. <laughs> and uh, eventually, when I, came, when I came to the States, I was lucky enough to, to receive the scholarship. And... Um, and that's how I bought my first set of, of buffet clarinets, which were R13s, both of them. Uh -huh. And I had those for a very long time. Uh, maybe too long, slightly. <laughs> um, and then when I came here, I just felt like it was, it was time to 
not just to get a new set of clarinets, but also I, I there were cer certain things that I wanted that I wasn't getting from that model. Um, yeah. Just full disclosure, that is not to say uh, one model is better than the other. Again, we're also different and we have different concepts of sound. Uh, and, and so, you know, it's great that a company like Buffet has plenty to offer as far as, you know, what, what to find. So you won the job on an R13. I did. I did. Yep. Good. And then I switched. <laughs> and my colleagues have regretted hiring me. <laughs> I doubt that. No. I'm just kidding. No <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, let's see. I've got another one here. Um, this one's just uh, sometimes we get with um, people that come into our store, very specific questions with playing clarinet and people who are kind of trying to get back into it or um, kind of continue progressing. But some people have issues with um, their throat tones sounding fuzzy or stuffy. So is there anything, maybe Gabby or, you know, or Matt kind of tips on how to get at that? I'll defer to Gabby on that. <laughs> that's, that's more of a player question, I think. Well, I, I would say, uh, depending on the on the level of the player and the age too, I might have different answers. The answer often, in my experience, is um, technique and, and how you're approaching the instrument. Because the throat tones are typically um, a little bit low and yes, stuffy. And that's just one of the traps of the clarinet because of, of how the, the instrument is constructed as far as it not being in octaves. Um, I can't get too deep as far as why that happens because I'm just not qualified. I'm not that technical. Um, but again, and, and I hate to sound like a broken record, the more familiar we are, you are with your instrument and, and your physiology, the better you're going to be able to pick a horn. There are some instruments that sit lower some mouthpieces as well it's not just the clarinet some mouthpieces as well and strengths of reed of course that sit lower in the throat tones so if you already know that that's your tendency then perhaps you shouldn't uh play on a on a horn that has that tendency even more pronounced than other instruments if that makes any sense um i mean I haven't done anything to my clarinets to correct for that. I, I find that, you know, with, with a little bit of focus, you know, technically speaking, that seems to do the trick. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a question of anticipation as well. Again, if, you, if you're practicing enough in an intelligent way, then, then you're better able to map out where those potholes are so you can better avoid them, right? Um, so just in, you know, to summarize, I would say, you know, it might be that, that you're not anticipating some of these issues and then you kind of fall, uh, fall victim, right, to, to the problems of the instrument. And, and this isn't, I don't, I, I really don't think that this is a, a maker specific issue because oboists deal with this and bassoonists deal with this and trumpets deal with this, right? I mean... The, the truth of the matter is, especially woodwinds, um, our instruments are not as quote unquote perfect as a violin, where if you play a violin out of tune, I, I really don't think it's the violin's fault. <laughs> right? It's, uh, it's, it's entirely the player's fault. In that. <laughs> oh, very yeah. true. Good. Well, let's see. Another question we have is about warranty. So Matt, can you explain a little bit on how does warranty work, especially crack repair? So how would somebody go about, you know, getting getting that worked on and how does that work with Buffet? Sure. So um, the warranty coverage on most of our professional clarinets is two years. And that covers uh, materials and workmanship. Uh, it doesn't cover things like pads. Or, or disposable parts of the instrument that, that are gonna degrade over time. Uh, obviously, it's going to cover something like a crack, a crack that is, is uh, produced by playing as opposed to you know, damage or abuse, like you sat on your clarinet or you dropped it or used it as a baseball bat or something like that. So the warranty process, as far as if, if you do have a problem, 
the, the first step is to contact the dealer that sold you the instrument. So if you bought your clarinet from Midwest Musical Imports, you would contact them, explain the situation to them. Probably it would be a good idea to have Eric or one of the technicians take a look at it and assess the, the problem. And if the technician determines that yes, it is a, a warranty issue, then what would happen is Midwest Musical Imports or whichever dealer you happen to be dealing with that you purchased the instrument through, then they would contact Buffet Crampon USA or the, the distributor, uh, the North American representative of the manufacturer in France. And then there are a couple of different avenues that we can take to resolve the issue. Um, if, for example, let's say you get a crack on your upper joint of your R13, um, you can have the instrument returned to Buffet Crampon USA to where our technician will repair the crack for you. Uh, the other alternative is to have the joint replaced. And we usually have a good stock of, of replacement joints on hand. If, if uh, the customer chooses that they would just to like to replace the upper joint, then what we can do is we can either have the clarinet return to us, have the joint replacement and the key transfer done here, or we can send the joint directly to the dealer, in this case, MMI, and then one of MMI's technicians would do the key transfer on site. And often that's a, that's a, a quicker way to resolve the issue. Uh, one thing that I do caution people about when they do have a crack issue and they, they inquire about doing a, a, a joint replacement is that you need to keep in mind that if you do that, you are replacing almost half of your clarinet. And as we all know, and we have, we have all learned over our time playing instruments, is that instruments are very personal and they're very, uh, there's a lot of variation because a, a clarinet is made out of wood and there's a lot of hand finishing. Clarinets play differently. And that also applies to a replacement joint. If you replace an upper joint on a clarinet, there is the possibility that that clarinet is going to play differently than what you were used to. So if it's a, a catastrophic crack to where, you know, it, it's just, it's beyond repair and you have to, you really need to replace the joint. And of course we're going to replace the joint. If it's a surface crack or a crack that, that doesn't affect the instrument in a, in a really catastrophic way, we recommend that the, that the crack is sealed or, or uh, replaced because that way you're retaining the quality of your clarinet, you're retaining the personality of your clarinet and you're not, literally, you're not changing the instrument. You're not changing half of the instrument. You're going to be able to, to keep that same instrument and not learn how to play a new instrument, potentially. You get that question a lot. <laughs> I do, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I have one kind of related to that then, um, especially with, you know, the area we live in. What would be the best way to keep your clarinet humidified? Gabby, you want to take that one? Gabby, what do you do? Yeah, yeah, I can. I, I'm happy to take that one. Um, uh, there are many things you can do uh, from keeping your clarinet next to your shower <laughs> <laughs> to um, making sure that there's some kind of humidity pack, sponge, um, or something that will, will hold moisture. Um, when I was in school, uh, you know, some people had suggested to use uh, orange peels. I'm not such a fan of that because, of course, the, the peel has acid and the acid can eat through the keys. Uh, and I think just there's, you know, more efficient alternatives. Um, you know, some some practical advice, and, and, and I know it may, it may sound like a uh, few people do this, but I've heard it enough, uh, even from professionals. You know, be sure, make sure you don't leave your clarinets in your, in your trunk overnight, especially in Minnesota, where, where it gets not just very cold, but more importantly, very dry, right? Um, if you have a humidifier uh, in your bedroom, for example, I, I, I like having a few of those in the bedroom. Uh, maybe it's a good idea to keep your clarinets there. Uh, but inside the case, I do think it's important to keep some kind of humidity um, String players have humidifiers. I don't know if you've seen them, but there are these green strings um, 
rubber strings, I think, and, and what's inside is a sponge. And, and you soak that and you remove excess water and you put that inside the instrument through um, the resonance halls uh, of, of, of the violin or cello or whatever. Um, and uh, for the clarinet, you could use that. And, and I don't know, I, perhaps it's not appropriate. Um, I couldn't answer that. Um, but some people have seen them, they, they put them inside the clarinet I personally have a case that closes 100% and um, it's even got a, humid a humidity, um, uh, I'm sorry, instrument to read, um, uh, would that be a barometer? Oh, like the gauge, yeah. Yeah, it has a gauge. Um, no, sorry, barometer is for, doesn't matter. Um, I, can, I can tell how much humidity is in the, in the case and I can put humidity packs underneath, directly underneath the horns. And not only that, it's also got a heating pad. So if I'm going to be outside for just half an hour, I can heat it up slightly. It, it, don't, don't be alarmed. It's, it's nothing too extreme so that the clarinet doesn't drop in temperature. Speaking of cracks, I mean, that's the, the best way to crack your instrument is to take them cold out of the case and start playing with them by blowing warm air in the cold uh, material. So... Um, humidity, 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 the same thing goes for reeds. I know we're not talking about reeds, but it, it's a similar concept. Good. Anything oh, else you wanna... sorry. One, oh. one more thing. Um, what, another thing I do here is I do oil my instrument a few times during the winter. So, um, yeah, hygrometer, right? So, um, <laughs> there is, um, almond oil. And you need to make sure that you get the right kind. Um, but maybe I'm a little bit more unorthodox. I think even if you just use some kind of higher quality olive oil, that's fine too. Just make sure you don't drench it. And, and that just, you know, apply slightly. Anything to keep moisture inside the bore is helpful. And sorry, I, I, I said, I, I know I said that would be the last thing. Make sure that you, that you use cork grease, high quality cork grease on your tenons. That's also going to keep the ends of the of the bore which are going to dry first from um essentially looking like a like a raisin <laughs> so true I, I know the oval players do that here that they talk about oiling all the time you know even when because a lot of people are like well you only need to oil maybe once a year but i think with our climate up here and matt we kind of talked about that in our interview you know our our location is going to be different than say if you lived in florida obviously <laughs> Um, There's a little bit. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, Gabby, I think it, it, it means a lot hearing it because you're playing all the time. You know, you're playing throughout the winter and, you know, we just see some really extreme things sometimes. So, but yeah. Okay. I, I think yeah. one thing to add, sorry, one thing to add, and this is from personal experience from when I was a, a, an idiot, a young idiot, is that if, if you do use a humidifier in your case, you must open it regularly. <laughs> and, and of course we we have a different kind of problem in florida because there is so much humidity and then of course you know the heat kicks in i mean it's it's 95 here today and and so humidity we have the opposite problem to where it's too humid and so if you do keep a humidifier in your case as, as gabby suggested which i think is a great idea just make sure you're ventilating it on a regular basis if you keep it closed up over the weekend you're going to come back to a pretty interesting science experiment on Monday morning. So, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. So, we have um, one last question here. It will be um, So, what events or show does a buffet participate in? Um, how can someone request buffet's presence at an event? And is there any cost associated with that? Right now, we're not doing anything. <laughs> And that's that's actually not entirely true. Um, as as we all know, things seem to be kind of lurching back to normal a little bit. Um, typically, we would we would participate in ICA Clarinet Fest in a lot of regional events. Um, of course, the Midwest Clinic in Chicago in December. Uh, none of those things are happening again this year. They they were all canceled last year. Once we get into March. Um, I do know at this point that the Midwest Clinic is 
tentatively scheduled to be on for December of this year. That's why, and I don't know if that's what you guys are hearing. Um, so we're crossing our fingers for that. As far as getting our participation uh, at a particular event, or if you wanna have one of our artists like Gabby uh, be a clinician for an event, um, the best way to do it is to contact our artist relations manager. Again, her name is Magali Trikosh. And um, if you want to email me about that, um, I'll be happy to pass that information along to you. Uh, Tori has that information as well. Um, as far as just having our presence at an event, if you want us to have an exhibit with clarinets for people to play test and potentially find an instrument for them, uh, the easiest way is to just contact uh, a division manager for Buffet. Uh, for uh, your area, it's a gentleman named Corey Simmons who lives outside of Minneapolis. Um, but we have division managers all over the United States and Canada, and uh, we, we love going to events like that, and we look forward to being able to return to, to regional events and national events to be able to see people and, and share our instruments with them. So, Yeah, we do too. <laughs> yeah. Looks like we do have one question uh, from an attendee. Uh, they live in Destin. Is it possible to visit Buffet? Now Absolutely. Um, so we are uh, hosting people at Buffet again, which we're very excited about. Um, it's not 100% back to normal yet, but we are able to bring people in to play test instruments and to select an instrument. As you can see, I'm, I'm sitting in one of our tryout rooms right now. Tori, you know this room very well. Um, so we're, we're not able to put out the number of clarinets that we had in the past. And we're much more restricted as far as how many instruments we put out and which models we put out. Uh, we're also requiring uh, a negative COVID test within 72 hours of a visit to Buffet. Of course, you do have to schedule a visit here. You, we don't have a retail space or anything, so you can't just walk in and, and start playing clarinets. We need to know you're coming ahead of time, uh, primarily to make sure that we have the models that you're looking for. We don't want you to make a trip all the way over here from Destin or Minneapolis or Los Angeles or wherever. If you're coming here to play a Tosca clarinet to select the cost, a Tosca clarinet and we have one, that's not really worth your time. We wanna have a selection of clarinets so you know that you are finding the right instrument for you. You feel good about your selection and you're confident that you found the right instrument for you. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we, we love to have people coming over the only, the only thing we request is that if you are going to make a trip to us, that you are coming with the intent to purchase a clarinet. It's not to come in and, and just sit around and play clarinets and kick the tires and have a good time, which we want you to do that too. But we, we want you to come to Buffet Crump on USA with the intent of, of finding a clarinet for yourself. But we, we love to have people visit, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, we have another fun question. What material is the yellow orange clarinet made of behind you? <laughs> you know, I put that up there and I wondered if we were going to get any questions about this. So, and Gabby, you, you haven't seen one of these, have you? Maybe online? I so played this, it, I played it, just not that material. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, this is a Lejeune, which is the top of the tradition boar family. But, however, you can tell this is not an African blackwood clarinet. Uh, it looks very, very different. This is a boxwood clarinet. And um, not to get too clarinet nerdy, but this is a material that some of the earliest clarinets were made out of. And it's a very different material than African blackwood, like the Lejeune that you see behind me. Um, in addition to just a different appearance, acoustically, it's very different. African blackwood or grenadilla wood that we typically see clarinets made out of is a very dense, very hard wood. Boxwood is a softer wood than African blackwood. So as you can imagine, the, the different density and the different hardness of this material is gonna result in a different resonance and a different sound that you get out of this material than you would a granadilla instrument. The bore of this instrument is identical to that instrument. It's a cylindrical bore, it's the tradition bore. But because of that different wood density and different uh, thickness, there's gonna be a different vibration and a different resonance. Um, and it's, we, we've had a few of our artists play this instrument. Of course, if you've seen any of the videos of uh, Nicolas Babu in France, uh, all the wonderful videos that he's made, he plays one of the boxwood clarinets for one of the parts. And um, 
the consensus is that because of the different material, this clarinet is, is really suitable for chamber music or for solo literature, maybe not quite as suitable for orchestral playing or playing with a large ensemble like a wind ensemble. But again, as Gabby said, everybody's different and everybody has a different playing style and some may find that this material uh, responds differently for them and works well for them in a large ensemble setting. But yeah, this is, this is the Boxwood Legion. Um, we are finalizing uh, the numbers that we're going to make of these instruments. It's going to be a very limited edition. Uh, they will be available in North America. We, we don't know exactly how many yet, but uh, we're very excited about it. There's a lot of buzz about it, and uh, I just ask you to stay tuned. <laughs> awesome. Very good. All right. So that kind of, oops, let's see. Is the boxwood clarinet lined? Ooh, good question. Oh, you mean uh, in the bore? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, it is polished, but it's not lined. Oh, I see. Will we be making rosewood instruments? Um, I don't know of any plans for a rosewood clarinet right now, but that doesn't mean we're not looking at other materials too. Yeah. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> all right, very good. Thank you for all for all the questions. So we are going to get to the giveaway portion of our live event right now. Um, we will start with Amelia. We have technically four giveaway items um, and we will have a question and this is how it works. You, whoever types in the answer first into the chat portion of this Zoom um, will be the winner and you will um, email Amelia um, your address and contact information um, if you are the first to answer. So get ready, get up to your computer Keyboard and get ready. <laughs> Wait, Gabby and I can't play them. Shoot. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, go ahead, Amelia. Okay. Um, so let's see. My first question here is what boar family does the festival model belong to? Ooh, that's a good one. Ooh. Uh, oh, Stephen. <laughs> R13. That's right. Very good. R13. Email Amelia. Good job, Stephen. I will put her email address in the comments right now. Amelia at nnmports.com. Good. Cool. So that did was you for did you show what it was? Yeah. So we're doing the 66 millimeter B flat mainig. Good. Cool. Okay. All right. The next thing we're going to do is a Daddario reed case. Holds eight reeds and it has its own humidity pack. So first question is. This is related to our interview that we did with Matt earlier um, in our series. So check that out on YouTube. What material was the Tosca model originally made with? What material? Ooh. <laughs> Picky one. We got one Grenadilla. <laughs> Grenadilla is not the correct answer. Any other guesses? You guys didn't do your homework. <laughs> Apparently, I didn't do my homework either. I don't know. <laughs> Ooh, oh, Michelle got it. I think nope. I saw it. Yes. Yep. Michelle got it. Matt nice. um, informed us. Actually, I did not know this myself. It's made a was green line was its first uh, material. Right, the Tosca was designed to take full advantage of the green lines, acoustic material and properties. That's right. Yeah. Cool. Good. Very good. Michelle, please email Amelia at Amelia at All right. Um, and then my other giveaway is um, a box of reeds. And my question is, we didn't, I don't think we talked about this one, but aside from the Boxwood Lejeune, what is the name of Buffet's newest, um, other newest clarinet model? And this is one based off the tradition and and the original legend model. Oh. <laughs> Not divine. It's a it's a brand new model. It's coming out around the same time as the boxwood. And it's available now actually. Oh, available now. 
I really should read the newsletter <laughs> sent out by uh, Bufek. <laughs> Um, Not, it's part of the legend family. It's part of the tradition family. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Oh, yeah. Very good. Good job, Steven. Steven. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And one just for fun. Last one we have is a set of fun thumb rests. Just fun, squishy, different colors. Fun for your students or for yourself. Okay. Last question. What are the three boar families for a buffet? Oh. Close. So close. close. Yes, Stephen got it. Way to go, Stephen. <laughs> Good job, Stephen. Good job. All right. Thank you all for being here as panelists and our attendees for sh showing up today. Thanks for your support. We really appreciate it. Um, so please check out our series for this event. We also are featuring Selmer and Royal Global as part of the series. So be sure to check out the YouTube videos. Um, you can find that on our YouTube page or on our Facebook. I've been posting a lot this week. So thank you so very much um, for your time. I really appreciate you guys. Yeah. Oh, and there's Matt's email. <laughs> yeah, feel free to email me if you have any questions about any of our products. I'm happy to help. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Right, thank you. Yeah. Have a good day. Bye.